Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to another episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I have an interesting episode for you today, I think. I call this one, Making Friends with Extraterrestrials. This is all about the lifelong experiences of a man I call Taylor Foster. That's not his real name, he doesn't want his real name used. But Taylor has had UFO experiences his whole life, they're very extensive, and I think provide a lot of insight into what it's like to be an experiencer. So that's why I wanted to do this video today. Taylor was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1953, and his first major experience occurred in 1964 when he was 11 years old. It was around 9 p.m. Uh, one evening when his mom sent him out to mail a letter. He lived only a few miles away from the local post office, so Taylor took the letter and uh, walked down the sidewalk and dropped the letter in the mailbox and was walking home, and this is when he had a major encounter. He was just walking past a three-story apartment building when a huge, giant object, a UFO, appeared right overhead, about 40 feet over the apartment building. As Taylor says, all of a sudden, it was like everything was quiet. There were no city noises. It was just like a dead silence. I remember looking around. In fact, I stopped and kind of looked around because I thought how strange this was. Taylor actually lived along a fairly busy two-lane highway, so it was very unusual for it to be quiet. There was no traffic, which was almost unheard of. Though this is something we do see in a lot of UFO cases, and certainly in this instance. And Taylor looked up and saw this enormous object. As he says, When I looked up, I couldn't see any of the stars like I had before. As I stared, all I could see was the bottom of this object. There was kind of like a grid work on the bottom. I could tell it was a vehicle, some kind of craft or something. And I thought, well, this is strange. This craft was big enough that it blotted out a large section of sky. Uh, he didn't quite understand what was happening. It was clear this was an aircraft of some kind, but it was obviously not a plane or a helicopter. And as he's looking at it, the word mother ship comes into his head. Uh, he's not sure why he thought that. He wasn't even really thinking about UFOs, had not really thought about them much at all. Uh, but as he's staring up at this thing, that's the word that came into his head. And next thing he knows, he's being struck by a beam of light. As Taylor says, the only thing I really remember was a light. That's all I recall. And the next thing I know, I proceed home. As Taylor walked home, he felt profoundly different, changed, almost enlightened. As he says, I could tell something had happened to me. It was like I had a new awareness of myself, other people, things. I suddenly saw, knew, and thought about myself in a clearer way. It was like not necessarily being older, but maybe being more intelligent, perhaps? I felt smarter somehow. I'm not sure how to word this, but anyway, it was certainly a big change at that very moment. I didn't really know what had happened. I went home. I was really excited. I tried to tell my mother what had happened, although I really didn't know what to tell her. It was hard to explain to her, just like it's hard to explain to you now. I remember saying something like, I feel as if a veil has been removed from my brain. The only thing she was concerned about was that I had mailed the electric bill and why was I so late. So this encounter profoundly changed Taylor. At the time, he had no memory of what had happened during this missing time. Uh, all he knew was he felt a whole new awareness and much smarter. But it wasn't long before he did start to remember and he actually recalled at least part of what happened during this missing time segment. And what he recalled was being taken on board this craft 
and meeting what appears to be human-looking extraterrestrials. As he says, I knew something profound had happened to me. Within a few days, whenever I would think about the event, I would see a picture in my mind of tall, thin men with long, blonde, straight hair, shoulder length. I started recovering things. Certain things kept coming to my mind. What I realize now is I had some kind of conversation with what I would call the Nordics. I don't remember details, but I do remember the Nordics. There were two or three males, all dressed alike in a kind of uniform, what I would call a uniform. It was black and white. They all wore their hair just alike. They all looked really similar to each other. They weren't twins, but they looked a lot like each other, and they were tall. They stood very straight with perfect posture. I knew we had conversations, but I just can't remember what they were. I just remember things were lit up pretty bright, pretty clean. I just don't have a lot of details. I felt a real closeness to them, like they were my best friends, more than friends, like family. It's just really hard to explain. I don't know what they did to me. It was definitely a positive encounter. Prior to this encounter, Taylor had been having a lot of trouble in school. As a very young kid, he had suffered from a weird speech impediment, which might be related to all this. As Taylor says, my mother always claimed that from the earliest age, I spoke a language that was something other than English. At times, my mother would have to rely on my little friends, my cousin and next door neighbor, to know what I was saying. So this is something that does turn up in a number of close encounter cases. And uh, eventually, Taylor, Taylor's mom sent him to a speech therapist to sort of improve his speech. Uh, and that did seem to work. But Taylor was having a lot of trouble uh, in school at this time. Uh, he, his grades were not good and his mom was extremely frustrated. And eventually at this point, uh, by coincidence, right after this encounter, she pulled him out of public school and put him into private school. And it was following this encounter that Taylor had a whole new awareness and his grades improved dramatically. And he had a very strong impulse to read and learn everything he could. Uh, Taylor's mom credits his sudden improvement in school with going to a new school, but Taylor feels like, no, it was his encounter with these friendly, human-looking extraterrestrials. As he says, this event changed my life forever, and I credit it with who I am today. It set the tone for the rest of my life. I cannot stress enough that this was a life-changing event. I suddenly had an insatiable desire to learn, to read and read. After reading our set of encyclopedias, my mother couldn't keep me out of the public library. So Taylor had a 180 degree turnaround and from that point on received AIDS all through school and college. Uh, he was always at the top of his class and would eventually grow up to be a doctor, a chiropractor. So he credits this encounter with really changing the pathway to his life. And from that point on, he really felt like these ETs were his friends, his family. And he had a deep longing to meet them again. And it wasn't long before he started having encounters. In fact, he and his family would often go outside and watch the UFOs as sort of a family pastime. In 1965 and 1966, there was a flurry of sightings over St. Louis, and uh, he and his parents would often go outside and watch them. As Taylor says, My parents and I used to go outside in the evening and watch them. They'd come across the city in waves. They were just bright lights in the sky. Sometimes there would be 20 or 30 at a time. Sometimes they would be in formation. Sometimes they wouldn't be. If they were in formation, sometimes two or three would break off 
and do all kinds of crazy acrobatic stuff. They would put on a real show, zigzagging and hot-dogging in the sky. It was just a thing the family did at that time, a lot of other families as well. It was kind of common. Uh, so for Taylor's parents, this was very interesting, but for Taylor, he felt a deep, deep connection to these objects. As he says, although I didn't talk about them to other people, they really became a part of my life. I felt a oneness and a closeness to them that I cannot explain. So this happened many times over the next few years. And it was around this time when Taylor was just a little kid that another weird incident happened, which apparently involves what Taylor believes is an alien implant. Taylor was playing out on the jungle gym and uh, suddenly he felt something dislodge from his nose. As he says, I was hanging from my knees upside down and I felt something kind of dislodge from my nose. I could feel something. I wanted it out, whatever it was, but I didn't want to pick my nose in front of my cousins. So I ran around the front of the house and I pulled this thing out of my nose. I started to throw it on the ground when I realized it was kind of shiny looking. So I looked at it closer. It was kind of like a shiny cylinder. It wasn't very large, maybe a quarter inch. And I just threw it on the ground and went back and played. At the time, I remember thinking, oh boy, they're not going to find me now. Why I thought that, I have no idea. So even though he didn't quite realize it was an alien implant, uh, apparently subconsciously he did. And this would not be his only experience with alien implants. Later on in life, he would have a much more dramatic incident. And meanwhile, other strange things continued to happen. It was just a few years later in 1969 that Taylor's father retired and decided to sell the house in the city of St. Louis and move out to a many acre farm outside the outskirts of St. Louis. Taylor was pretty disappointed and actually became quite worried because he thought that his ET friends might not be able to find him. But it wasn't long after they moved that he had another really dramatic encounter. He was 16 years old, and one of his favorite pastimes was to go hiking behind the house where they had a little forest and a pond area. It was a really beautiful nature area where he liked to just sit and meditate. And uh, one day he went out hiking behind the house to this pond, and he came upon two deer. And uh, he thought that they looked a little bit strange because uh, they were standing there and looking at him. Uh, but he didn't realize at that time that they were anything other than deer. So he just continued walking towards the pond and then later came back home. However, over the next few weeks, uh, he kept thinking about this weird incident with the deer and uh, started to remember a different story. He realized that was a screen memory. As Taylor says, This is kind of hard to explain, but at the time I thought I saw two deer. I stood there and watched them. They watched me. But it wasn't really two deer I was looking at. It was two greys. I looked around and there was a small craft to the left of me in the clearing. The two greys then led me to the UFO. The screen memory worked for a while, but I always knew that something more had occurred. It wasn't long before Taylor had another encounter. In fact, it was just one year later at age 17 in the summer of 1970 that he was again hiking to the pond behind his house when he came upon what he thought was an owl. Uh, but somehow he knew that it wasn't an owl and uh, it was just shortly after this owl encounter that the screen memory crumbled and he realized that what he had actually seen was a gray ET. He remembers coming around a little bend in the pathway to this pond and seeing not an owl but a female gray hovering in the air 
just above the little road there. As Taylor says, I thought it was a female. That was my impression. It was something very alien. I can't describe it really well. I think maybe it was a gray, but I don't know for sure. As I walked around the road, I could get a better look at it. It was something up in the air. It wore a white tunic or dress. It was hovering. It didn't have any legs or feet touching the ground. I remember walking up to it. I couldn't even tell you exactly what it looked like. I remember walking up to it and having a conversation. She conversed with me, but about what? I have no idea. One of Taylor's biggest encounters occurred just one year later, and this was at the house itself. At this time, Taylor was 18 years old. It was a hot summer weekend in 1971, and the house was filled with all kinds of people. Taylor's relatives had come to visit. His older brother was there with his wife and children. It was a Sunday afternoon, and everyone was outside playing, when suddenly, some, when suddenly someone shouted out, What is that? Everyone came running outside, who wasn't already outside, and hovering just over the trees at the far end of this 60-acre field was a silvery, metallic, saucer-shaped object. Multicolored lights moved in rhythm around its perimeter, and everyone stared at this object in complete awe. Taylor's nephews jumped up on the picnic table and the barbecue pit, and Taylor's mom and him were on the porch there. Taylor's father was right there at the front of the driveway holding a pail of milk, and all of them just stood there staring at this object. So Taylor suddenly had an idea. Uh, he had a rifle inside the house with a 20, it was a 22 rifle with a powerful scope mounted on it. And he wanted to get a closer look at this object, so he ran inside to get his rifle, not to shoot it, obviously, but to look through the scope at it. And so he runs inside, grabs the rifle, and runs outside. And this is when he gets an incredible shock. As he says, The UFO was still there. I brought the rifle up to my shoulder, looked through the scope, and it was gone. I thought maybe I just can't get it in my field of vision. So I pulled the rifle down. I looked again with my naked eye, and it was gone. And here's where it gets really strange. As he looked at his family, he saw that everyone was completely frozen in place. And in fact, the whole world appeared to be frozen. Birds weren't flying, leaves weren't moving. Everything was as if time had stopped. The only problem was Taylor himself could move. As he says, everyone was still standing in the same position as before. They all had their backs to me as if they were still watching the UFO, which I could see was gone. And I thought that was a little bit odd, but I didn't think too much about it. So I walked off the deck and started around the house. Then I realized that everybody was frozen, still staring at the same place as they were before. It was like time had stood still for them, but not for me. And when I got around to the end of the house, I could see my father. He was in mid-stride, carrying a bucket. I can't remember if the bucket had milk or water in it, but even the droplets were frozen in time as they splashed over the top of the bucket. I thought, well, this is really, really weird. This is really odd. So looking around, uh, he suddenly saw the UFO. It had landed next to the driveway in front of the house. And uh, it was metallic, quite close. All the lights were off. And he saw coming out of it were three grays walking towards him. As he says, they were approximately four feet tall, large heads, black eyes, skinny bodies, 
long arms, skinny legs. I couldn't tell if they had any clothes on or not, certainly nothing shiny. It was just three grays walking towards me. And that's all I remember. The next thing I know, everybody just kind of woke up and started doing what they were doing. Nobody said a word about the UFO or anything. So everyone just suddenly unfroze and kept on, like as before, playing or doing their chores. It was as if nothing unusual had happened at all. And even Taylor himself sort of forgot about the incident until about three days later when it all popped back into his head. And he was very curious about that, so he went and he walked up to his mom and says, do you remember seeing that UFO the other day? And she looked at him with surprise. She had forgotten it, but now she remembered. She said, oh yeah, I do remember that. So there's that weird amnesia aspect. And t while Taylor doesn't remember what happened during the on-board, presumably <laughs> on-board segment, uh, he did come away from this experience um, thinking some very strange thoughts. As he says, During this time, I felt a great calamity was going to befall the human race, and I felt that I was to somehow help lead people to safety. This seemed crazy to me. Why would adults want to follow me? And besides, where was I to lead them? I didn't know. Of course, unknown to Taylor, this is a very common theme. ETs do often report that we are heading for calamity, and many experiencers feel like th at some point they are going to be leading people onto the ships. So this is something we do here quite often. So Taylor's experiences continued very regularly. It was one year later he had another dramatic sighting, it was very early morning and he was driving to college with a friend when suddenly this star-like object dropped down out of the sky. At first he thought it was a shooting star, but it was during the day, so that was weird. This object comes very low, stops still in the sky, and immediately darts straight up. It was a very brief sighting, but impressed him very much and, of course, his friend. Uh, it was around this time he had his first exposure in the media to the UFO subject. The television movie, The UFO Incident, appeared on TV. This, of course, portrays the Betty and Barney Hill incident. And while he thought the movie was very interesting, uh, he was kind of surprised to see that it was also quite scary and frightening, which puzzled him because... To him, the ETs were not at all scary. He considered them friends. So Taylor's life continued. Uh, he grew up, he became a chiropractor, and uh, it was in 1980, at age 27, when he was going to visit relatives in P Pine Bluff, Arkansas, with his mom and his niece, when he had a really dramatic encounter. Uh, they were driving along when they saw this bright, bright light pacing them along the highway. As Taylor says, I first thought it was a spotlight on top of a small building just to the side of the road. It was driving about 80 miles an hour, and yet I was not catching up to this light. It just stayed in the distance. Taylor's mom also saw the lights, and she turned to him and says, Do you see that light? And yes, Taylor replied. And she says, Well, why aren't we catching up to it? I don't know, Taylor replied. And uh, at some point, they did catch up to it, and they realized it was not one light, it was four. As Taylor says, directly across from the interstate, traveling just above the tree level, were four round lights, two on the bottom and two on the top. They moved as one unit. Taylor got an idea. As he told his mom, I'm going to try something. He was going to vary his speed and see if the UFO continued to pace their car. As Taylor says, I dropped my speed down to 40. The UFO did the same. And then I'd go up to 80, and it would go up to 80. Then I'd back off, and it would back off. It was going perfectly parallel to us. 
We traveled a little farther and it slowed down and dropped to ground level behind some trees. I thought, well, that's the end of it, end of it, when suddenly it was right back with us again. It did that two or three times, where it would just drop down behind the trees. It was so weird. This cat in mouse game went on until we reached the suburbs of Pine Bluff. It stopped and of course we went on. My mom and I had seen a lot of UFOs by this time, but this was something totally new to us. To me, this incident was the highlight of a close encounter of the first kind. I had witnesses, and it appeared to be reacting directly with my vehicle's speed. It was very exciting for all of us. So around this time, Taylor started to have some real... Uh, Around this time, Taylor began to wonder how it, the UFOs are able to move the way they do, dart at right angles and move at super high speeds. And it wasn't long after this that Taylor woke up inside a UFO and the ETs gave him a full-on demonstration of how they are able to dart around like that. Taylor woke up inside the UFO and saw grays inside. As he says, there were three grays there. The inside of the vehicle was round. Everything was clean and put up very well. And there was a transparent plastic looking chair. It looked like acrylic. You could almost see through it. And it was molded for a human form. There was a place to put your arms and legs. They telepathically instructed me to sit in the chair I asked them what the purpose of the chair was, as it was obviously for humans and not them. They told me this was how humans were able to travel with them to survive the G-forces that their craft produced. I sat in the chair and put my arms in the molded armrests. It was pretty comfortable. The next thing I knew, from out of the ceiling came the other half of the chair, the front half. It fit right over the top of me and it fastened to the half I was sitting in and latched. At this point, I was completely sealed and enclosed in this chair, but I could see out as the entire chair was a clear plastic type substance. And I thought, okay, this is different. At this point, something very unusual happened, which quite frightened Taylor at first. Little did he know this is something that many experiencers have also reported. In fact, Betty Andreessen had a nearly identical experience. But I'll just continue on with what Taylor says. So he's sitting in this chair, and then as he says, then I heard a swishing sound, like water running. And I quickly realized that this enclosed chair I was sitting in was filling up with warm fluid. I remember telling myself not to get excited, not to lose my composure, but then it began to fill up higher and higher, and I began to get kind of scared. I thought, well, what are they going to do? Drown me in this thing? No sooner had I thought this when they telepathically told me not to worry and to breathe. You're going to be okay. Just breathe. Breathe. The lukewarm substance rose higher than my mouth and nose, and I began holding my breath. They kept telling me to breathe, that it would be okay. And I thought, what do you mean, breathe? I held my breath like anybody would do. They're, st they're still telling me, just breathe. It's okay. Just breathe. Finally, I had no choice but to breathe. I took in a big gulp, and to my surprise, I found that I could still breathe. So, yeah, as I mentioned, this is quite a common experience for uh, people who have been taken on board UFOs. In fact, I did a whole prior video about this, uh, which I called the breathing pool. So this is apparently, according to you know Taylor's ETs, how they are able to transport people and still move at super high speeds and darting around and so forth. Uh, it's a very strange thing that does happen to people who are taken on board UFOs. 
Meanwhile, Taylor's encounters continued. Uh, one uh, day in 1986, he heard a loud roar over his house. He went rushing outside to see what it could possibly be and saw it was a jet. And right in front of the jet was a silver metallic saucer-shaped object easily evading the jet, almost as if playing with it. And it was following this incident that Taylor started to see a lot of unmarked black helicopters hovering over his house. And this went on and on, and it was quite unusual because he lived in a pretty rural area. So uh, this was quite unusual. Meanwhile, the sightings continued. Um, many of these were just anomalous lights uh, of no real great significance, certainly not to Taylor, who had become used to seeing UFOs uh, quite regularly. But occasionally, these sightings would become quite dramatic. Uh, his next really dramatic sighting occurred in 1993. He was dating a new girl and had gone out to eat at the local fast food joint and was sitting out on the veranda which overlooked this valley. This was a rural valley which was dotted with small homes here and there. And they were looking down at all the homes and just enjoying the view when their uh, gaze settled upon one particular house. And uh, they thought it was strange because it was perfectly round and it had little colored lights all around it. And it was a little bit bigger than most of the other houses. And uh, this is when something very unusual happened. As Taylor says, we began discussing this house when suddenly it began to rise straight up from the ground. It did this very slowly until it was about 300 to 500 feet above the ground. Then it slowly glided away from us until it was finally out of sight. One year later, he had another dramatic sighting. This was in 1994. He was going to the post office and looking up, saw a very bright spherical object with this, these enormous cones of light coming off of it. As he says, I noticed this really, really intensely bright light in the sky. It was so bright. There was so much power coming off of it. It was hard to look at. You know how a snow cone has a point on the bottom with the ice being the ball on top? Well, this had a point of energy coming off the top and the bottom. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing was just gone. So uh, one year later, he started dating another girl. You know, he fell in love with her and eventually would marry her. Uh, I call her Karen. This is also a pseudonym. And uh, he told Karen that... Uh, asked her, do you believe in UFOs? And she said, no, I don't really believe in them. He said, well, have you ever seen one? And she said, no. And he said, well, you know, if I had never seen one, I wouldn't believe in them either. But if we're going to be together, you will be seeing them. Karen was still a little skeptical, but she said, okay. And uh, thought that Taylor was just being a little bit weird and odd, uh, but it turned out Taylor was right. It wasn't long before she started seeing UFOs, and uh, they would be just walking around or stepping outside of the house, and there would be these anomalous lights darting around. And at first she wasn't quite sure what to make of them, but it wasn't long before one of these things came quite close, and she could see that it was a metallic saucer, a dome on top, little colored lights around the perimeter, and she became a huge believer. As Karen says, and I quote, I tell people, if you want to see something, just hang around Taylor. I mean, we have friends who didn't believe, and when they got to know Taylor, they had some pretty good sightings. He's very in tune with them. So these sightings continued constantly. I mean, more than a few months wouldn't go by before they would have another really dramatic sighting. Taylor was keeping a notebook at this time. Uh, the notebook had reached a couple of hundred pages, 
Most of these are about anomalous lights, but occasionally these objects would become quite close. One time they stepped out of their house, he and Karen, and they saw this huge object just hovering there. And it was off to the side, so Karen says, why don't we go and get in the car and see if we can get closer? And they did. And as they drove towards this object, it started moving away. And uh, they drove after it. And uh, it, this began a long cat and mouse game. They ended up driving for a couple of hours, uh, 50 or 100 miles out of town. Uh, at one point, they did get within a couple of hundred feet but it soon became clear to them the object was not going to let them get any closer. So they turned around and drove back home, and they weren't surprised when this object followed them all the way home. So yeah, this was just a bright, glowing, football-shaped object, but they counted as another one of their really dramatic encounters. Uh, so uh, the next sighting, occurred in uh, 1997, one year later. They were driving along the hi highway when Karen noticed it first, a huge glowing sphere of light. And she pointed it out to Taylor. He's like, yep, that looks like one of them. Uh, and she's just watching it when suddenly she sees about six smaller objects also glowing and darting around and uh, she pointed them out to Taylor, and Taylor said, well, keep your eye on them. Maybe they'll go into the big one. He's not sure why he said that, but shortly after he said that, boom, <laughs> all these objects started darting around and swoosh, they went closer to the big spherical object and one by one went right inside of it. So that was definitely weird. Uh, it was some years later, in 2004, February of 2004, that they had another dramatic encounter. Taylor's neighbor called him up and said, there is a UFO hovering over my house. Taylor's neighbor lived about a half mile away. So Taylor uh, and Karen hopped in their car and drove the half mile. And sure enough, there was this huge bright orange-red sphere. And as they watched, this orange-red sphere began to swirl in this kind of swirling pattern in the center. And the center part disappeared, and it became this very odd-looking ring of light. To, to Taylor, it looked almost like a portal. And as soon as it became this glowing ring of light, another orange object, an orange sort of orb, appeared above it, and uh, after a few moments, both, both of them winked out. It was just a few uh, weeks later, Taylor had another sighting where this object was hovering over his house. He went outside and flashed his flashlight at it, and he flashed it once and was going to flash it again, but instantly his flashlight died. The batteries went completely dead. So it was just a month or two after that that uh, Taylor had a very dramatic encounter in which the ETs came into his bedroom. And this time it appeared they did not come for him, but instead came to visit his wife, Karen. As Taylor says, I woke up and there was a gray standing on the side of my bed next to my wife. I looked at it and it was gray in color and my first thought was, am I looking at a ghost? Then it dawned on me, that's a gray. It had a big head. Telepathically, it told me, I was dreaming. Go back to sleep, and no harm will come to her. It said to me, lie back down and go to sleep. Everything is okay. And like a good subject, I thought, yeah, okay, she'll be okay. So I lay back down. Then I thought, wait a minute, I've got to look at this. I rose back up and the gray was still there, but he was leaning over my wife. All I could see was the top of its round, bald head. And I remember thinking, okay, everything is all right, and I went back to sleep. It was just a few days, 
or that morning, they woke up and there was nothing unusual, but it was just a few days later that something very unusual happened. Karen woke up and her pajama bottoms were gone, missing. She had certainly gone to bed with them on, so that was very odd. And uh, a few days, or actually that uh, afternoon, Karen noticed a mark on her abdomen. It was a bruise about the size of a nickel, right over where her ovaries would be. So Taylor felt a little bit of guilt there, like he had, it was because of him that his wife had become involved with these grays. But she was very understanding and uh, told him that it was fine. Um, so it wasn't long after that, uh, she had another encounter. It was just a few months later in August 2004 when she woke up and found a round bruise on her chest. Again, it was about the size of a nickel. So Taylor again felt a little bit of guilt, but Karen assured him that everything was fine, that she still loved him and that they were good. So around this time, Taylor was curious how these ETs were able to just come into his house, moving through solid walls. And he telepathically asked them, how do you do this? How are you able to move through solid walls? And it was just a short time later that they gave him a full-on demonstration. In fact, they did it twice. Taylor woke up a few days later, or one evening, he woke up to find three grays in his bedroom. And they showed him how they were able to move through solid walls. As Taylor says, I was on my side looking at the outside wall, which was about five feet from me. I woke up just in time to see the wall dissolve, and I could see through the wall. I could see trees and stars through the hole. It was like there was just no wall there. Where there was wall, there was nothing. Then you move over a little bit, and there was a foggy-looking stuff, and then you could see the wall. I was thinking, this is really weird, because there's supposed to be a dresser there, and where's the dresser? That's what I was thinking. And about that time, in walk three grays. They just walked or floated right into the room, marching in single file. They walked down to the end of the bed, lined up in a row at the end of the bed, and that's all I remember. It was just a few days later that they gave him another dramatic demonstration. As Taylor says, I awoke in the middle of the night. I was on my back, so I was looking straight up when the ceiling began to dissolve. Again, I could see the stars in the night sky. That's what I thought. Then, what I thought was a star from very high up dropped down to my rooftop level. As it descended, I could make out the shape of a craft. In the middle of the bottom of the craft was a large blue light. The blue light began to descend from the craft through the hole in the ceiling onto me and my bed. And this is all I remember. It was one year later, on September 1st, 2005, that Taylor had one of the most unusual encounters with his in his life. Uh, for the last couple of years, he had been suffering from this weird boil-like growth on his left cheek. It had just appeared one day, and he didn't know what to make of it, but it stayed there. And he was shaving, had cut himself, and his wife was checking him out to make sure he was okay. And she said, you know, what you really need to do is have something done about your face. And she pointed to this boil on his left cheek. And uh, Taylor was kind of joking. He said, yeah, well, it's probably just an alien implant. And apparently the ETs must have been listening in on this conversation because that night Taylor was taken on board and the Greys were not happy. Uh, as Taylor says, I just remember finding myself on an examination table with a gray standing over me. 
I could only see the gray from the waist up, and he was scolding me like a child. He was telling me, This is ridiculous. I'm going to have to take that implant out. You've gone through far too many of these. Taylor looked at the gray in surprise and asked, You mean that really was an implant? Yes, the gray told him telepathically. And Taylor said, You know, I was only joking. Uh, but the gray replied, Yeah, but you put the idea in your head and eventually you would have acted on it like you have done before. And Taylor thought to himself, Before? What is he talking about? And then that's when he remembered that he had fished out that object uh, out of his nose when he was just a little kid. And at this point, the gray started to perform an operation on this boil. And Taylor again told the gray, you don't have to take it out. I was only joking. And the gray replied, no, we have no choice now. And when we put the next one in, you'll never find it. Uh, Taylor doesn't remember much else about this experience. He felt no fear at the time. He woke up, he estimates, 30 minutes earlier than he normally would and instantly remembered this experience and wondered, could this have been a dream, even though he knew it wasn't? And as Taylor says, the first thing I did was put my hand up to my cheek and there was no lump. It was just gone. And I thought, maybe I'm on the wrong side. I checked the other side and it wasn't there. And I thought, well, this is really weird. Taylor uh, got up and went to the kitchen where he found his wife, Karen, and he pointed to his face where this boil, this cyst, had been. And he said, Is it gone, or is this my imagination, or what? And Karen peered at his face, and she said, No, it's gone. As Taylor says, I looked it over real good. There were no cut marks, nothing to show how they removed it. However, about three days later, it was like the skin over it just disintegrated. It just rotted away. It was very strange. So it was around this time that Taylor and Karen started to notice weird poltergeist-like activity in their home. This is certainly common among experiencers. They noticed doors opening and closing, lights going on and off, objects moving by themselves, strange sulfur-like odors, all kinds of stuff. They once saw an apparition of a dog. Another time they saw an apparition of what looked like a shadow person. Just weird stuff, and it wasn't only them. Uh, family members would come over and they would see it too. And meanwhile, they continued to have regular UFO sightings. Uh, one time, in 2006, Taylor was driving home and was nearly home when he came upon a pickup truck stopped in the middle of the road and the people inside were staring up at the sky. He looked up and saw this UFO and as soon as he looked at it, the object darted away. Another recent sighting also occurred in 2006 when he saw more objects uh, little discs with red, green, and blue lights on them. Uh, and uh, the sightings no longer surprise him. He's become totally used to them. Uh, one time he saw one very close up, as he says, I saw one the other day off the interstate. It was hovering over the creek, and I never even thought of stopping, as crazy as that sounds. It had a double row of windows, one on top of the other, was shaped like a top. My wife and I drove right by it. We slowed down, we looked at it, and kept on going. So they were so used to UFOs <laughs> by this time that it was no longer news to them. Uh, they often saw UFOs, uh, not only around their home, but whenever they traveled, UFOs would appear. Uh, once they went all the way to California, and they had a series of sightings there. They were driving down the 5 freeway by the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, and they saw a UFO hovering right over the plant itself. So 
if they can have sightings all the time and are continuing to have sightings to this day. Uh, Taylor is not sure why him. Uh, his parents both have had sightings, but neither of them report any close encounters. Uh, he does believe other people within his extended, extended family might be also having encounters because one day he went to visit his cousin and was surprised to see that she had stickers and pictures of grades all over her house. He wanted to ask her about it, uh, but he just didn't do it. So he's not sure why him, uh, but he does admit that there were some unusual things about him, medically speaking. Of course, he did speak that weird language as a kid, and this is something we have heard from other abductees. In fact, Bud Hopkins' star client in the book Intruders, uh, Debbie Jordan Cobble, reports that she had that experience with her child. So maybe there's something there. But Taylor said another unusual thing about him was that he did not have normal baby teeth. His baby teeth were actually like adult teeth. All of them had full roots to them. So that was very unusual. Another thing that was medically unusual about him is that he has an extra vertebrae in his spine. I found that very interesting because this is something a few other experiencers have told me that they also have. So maybe there's a relation there. I don't know. Uh, but whatever the case, Taylor continues to live with constant UFO sightings. In October of 2006, they had a sighting when this object was right over his house, as Taylor says. I went out the front door the other night, and there was one kind of behind the trees to the southeast of us, and it was just stationary in the sky, and it was pulsating white, green, blue, and red lights. This is what we see a lot. We see a lot of those particular things. So he always enjoys getting a witness, and he called out his wife, Karen, and he said, Hey, Karen, there's one out front. You want to come look at it? And she said very nonchalantly, Well, I'm reading the paper right now. I'll be out there in a minute. <laughs> so it's no big thing to her either. But uh, Taylor returned into the house, did a few chores, and about 15 minutes later, after Karen was finished reading the newspaper, they went outside. And as Taylor says, it was still there, but it had changed locations. So we looked at it for maybe a minute or so and went back into the house. We checked again at about 10 o'clock and it was gone. So yeah, this is Taylor's uh, experience with extraterrestrials. He sees them so regularly that it's no big thing for him. He considers them his friends, his family, and continues to have regular encounters with them. And... Uh, Currently, um, I'm still in touch with Taylor. He uh, contacted me and let me know that he is still having encounters. And also, he has started investigating other people's encounters himself and is helping them with their experiences. So I told Taylor's story in my book, Inside UFOs. I like Taylor's story because it's more extensive than most. He has a real relationship with ETs, has been able to converse with them and interact with them in a real way, with them putting on dis, you know, demonstrations, putting on little shows for him, and he's had very long conversations with them. And I think this typifies what happens when someone gets over the fear barrier and is able to interact with them in a much more normal way. And that's why I really wanted to do this episode because it shows that people can have a relationship with extraterrestrials that is absolutely benevolent. So that's it for now. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I really appreciate you watching. Thanks very much. And until next time, keep wondering, love each other, and most importantly, keep having fun.